Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Square Presbyterian Church. We gather here in God's presence to respond in worship, to come and respond to the one who has created us and redeemed us in Christ. And so just as a way to begin, let's take a moment to talk about some announcements and to look at the order of worship. And the open inside cover, you'll see uh, information about children's classes and youth classes that are happening today. There's a preschool class and the children's worship class, but also there is a junior high class that Pastor Eric will be teaching. So those kids that will be dismissed in just a moment. Um, but if you look also in the back of the, the order, you'll see um, some different things that are coming up. Uh, in the near future, we have uh, an Ash Wednesday service that will be on March 2nd. We're still sorting out what time that will be, so I'll communicate that soon. But it'll be here at the Nazarene Church building on March 2nd. Also, um, there is a class that Pastor Brian will be leading that's going to start during the season of Lent on Wednesday nights. You'll see that here leaving Egypt, finding God in the wilderness places. And that's at seven o'clock in the community space. So if you have questions or interest, talk to Brian about that. There's also the ongoing women's Bible study on Thursdays that all, all women are invited to come. You, and there's a Zoom link in the weekly email that you can uh, find there. Well, God has called us and gathered us and we gather in person, but also online. So we're thankful that the spirit of God can connect us during this time. And all the children that are going to participate in preschool class or children's worship or junior high, they can be dismissed at this time. They make their way uh, to the back of the sanctuary. Uh, Melinda's there in the back corner to take them downstairs. And Pastor Eric is over by the entrance to take the students to the junior high class that he'll be leading. Well, as we prepare to come before God in worship, let's take a moment of quiet to prepare our hearts. Good morning. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 138. Will you stand with us and we'll sing it together. the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called you answered me, my strength of soul you increased. the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands.
Let's pray. Almighty God, you who hold the already and the not yet, our God of great provision and the God who is in the wilderness and the desert, you Lord who promise a banquet and a God of manna, as we gather and worship this morning, make us aware of your abiding presence. Loving God, open our hearts to, to both receive and to give, to drink deeply of your love and then to give abundantly from it. How often we can settle for something less, scapegoating, idolatry, dismissing or diminishing the impact that our sin and the other sin has had on human life. Lord, even that desire to cancel we know it's easy to walk down these invigorating paths. But Father, open our imaginations to see your self-giving love and be changed by it. May our lives be filled up with your spirit-led, your resurrection life that Jesus purchased with his, his blood. Lord, as we continue to, to hold weariness, exhaustion, longing, give us hope, meet us with all of the delight and wonder and surprise that Jesus' life and death and resurrection bring to our anxious and hungry hearts. Father, we come in faith, praying all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, we turn now to our confession and assurance, to time to acknowledge with God our sin and our need of him. And we'll do this together as a church and have a time of quiet personal confession. Loving Father, we confess that we often try to do things on our own. We worry about how we will, be, we will be provided for, forget that you give us everything we have and make us who we are. Forgive us for thinking only of ourselves, for not trusting you to care for us, and forgive us when our plans are all working out and we forget that we need you. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please take a moment of quiet personal confession.
Father, we confess our sin and our need for your redemption. We're grateful that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive, and in Christ to, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. We give thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. We'll stand together to say together the words of assurance that come to us from Philippians chapter 1. Please join me. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Mercy speaks by Jesus' blood, hear and sing ye sons of God, justice satisfied indeed, Christ has full atonement made. Jesus' blood speaks loud and sweet, hear all deity can meet, and with New Testament lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, 
as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. On one occasion, when the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he said to him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Again, it's good to be with you and have a chance to look at God's word together. Thanks, Taylor, for reading from the scriptures. Uh, we are going to continue with our study of the Old Testament prophetic book of Jonah. And uh, as we enter into chapter two, it's kind of going to take a moment to, to kind of look at a couple of things before we read our passage. First, just to kind of recap where we are and to see the movement of the story that begins with God calling Jonah. Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, call them to repent of their evil. God calls, but Jonah does the exact opposite. Instead of going east to the great city of Nineveh, he flees west on a ship set for Tarshish, kind of the edge of the world. Jonah does this because he wants to avoid God's presence, and he also thinks that the Ninevites don't deserve mercy. They should get whatever's coming to them. So he flees, but the Lord will not let him go. God hurls a great wind upon the sea, and a mighty storm rises on the waters. So at this point, the sailors on the boat, they come to Jonah and ask, what should we do to quiet the waters? And Jonah, his actions are not to turn to God, not to pray, but instead to tell them to throw him overboard, that the waters will be calm from their raging. Well, they try to row out of the storm, but they can't, and eventually they do throw Jonah into the waters, and the storm ceases. And I recap that to say that the story could end right there, <laughs> right? The lesson maybe for Jonah, for the sailors, for us, what would the lesson be? Run from God and see what happens. Disobedience brings storms and even death. But the story goes on. God's not done. And as Jonah sinks beneath the waves, the Lord in his mercy appoints a great fish to swallow him. And it's from this strange place that Jonah cries out to God. And as we'll see in a moment, every line of Jonah's prayer either quotes or evokes from the Psalms, 150 Psalms that God gives his people to speak to him, to sing. 
And we might ask, why does this in the book that's all prose, why all of a sudden is there this poetry section? And it's a chance for us to reflect that sometimes our pain and our experiences call for something more than straightforward prose, straightforward statements. This form evokes emotions and it offers us a way to express to God our feelings and experiences, especially those that are confusing, bring shame, or distressing. And it's also in this form because Jonah borrows words from the Psalms to speak to God, but in turn, we are invited to borrow Jonah's words that you and I can participate, even making this prayer our own. So let's look at Jonah. We're gonna, I'm going to read from verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, through the end of chapter 2, but we're going to focus on Jonah's prayer. But let me read for our context as well. You can follow in your order, your Bible, or just listen as I read. The sailors picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is God's word given for our good. Well, what I'm hoping that we can see this morning as we reflect on this prayer that Jonah makes from the belly of the fish, I hope that we can see as Jonah sinks under the waves, but then is raised up, that he is pointing to what we might call a gospel pattern. A gospel pattern that first, there's an awareness of our need for help, and second, there is hope and a God the one who lifts up the fallen, the one who leads out the helpless. So let's start with Jonah sinking under the waves in an awareness of our need. Well, Jonah has been fleeing, as I already mentioned. He has maintained his silence before God, but now he calls to the one who first called him. I called out to the Lord out of my distress. I cried Distress. He describes it as the belly of Sheol, the underworld, that he is alive, but he is stuck. The belly of Sheol means the very mouth of death. Inside the fish is like a burial cave that he is closed in. I cry to you, Lord, because you are the one who cast me into the deep. The flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Throughout the story, we have been seeing that God is the one who appoints. He calls Jonah. He hurls the storm upon the sea. He appoints the great fish. And Jonah now even sees the waves washing over him as belonging to God. It's a chance for us to see and to hold dear that the one ultimately directing this story is not the sailors, it's not Jonah, but it's the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And 
that reality brings forth the question for us is where do we find mercy? Where do you and I find the mercy of God? In Jonah's case, it was through this extreme difficulty of being in distress. It was through the flood and the Lord's waves that began for him to see things in new ways. To encounter his condition, his inability to control his path or even to rescue himself at this point. And why it might be difficult, it's worth us thinking about moments or events that have been painful or even excruciating in our lives, but later came to yield more good in our lives than we could have foreseen. I can think in my own experience in which pain is still pain and loss is still loss. But yet with hindsight, I can see how God has taught me humility or helped me wrestle with the proud certainties that I held dear, opening me to compassion or even a mercy towards others. I think it's true that in general we do not learn of our need, our condition, or our lack of power simply by being told. That we have to enter the valley, the valley of sickness and loss, the pit of shame and guilt, or the deep, the deep of mistreatment. And it's there we might encounter God's severe mercies, that we might see things anew, come to our senses or even wake up. It's in his new vision that Jonah says, I have driven out of your sight. I've been driven from your presence. Yet the waters closed and I went down. Theologian Joyce Baldwin writes, our story has been depicting Jonah as descending, going down the whole book. God called Jonah, but he went down to Joppa. He went down to the docks. He went down inside the ship to hide. And now finally he goes down into the very deep. And as he's sinking, he realizes he wants not to flee, but he wants the actually presence of God. Given the distance and the nature of travel to Tarshish, I imagine not too many of us have been on a wooden boat, you know, out in the seas in the ancient world. Most scholars think the journey could have taken as long as a year. And therefore, Jonah must have brought a considerable amount of money and supplies with him. Think about that. He's all ready to go. He's ready to make this departure. He's paid his fare. He goes down this path. And now it is all gone. And think for a moment of what we invest in our attempts to control, our attempts to hide, what we are convinced will make things work out or make us happy, that we give our resources to it. We sacrifice ourselves or our relationships even for it. Jonah has put all of his things into this going down. And what it has done, all that has happened, is it's taken him to the bottom. Alone. And he's facing the fact that he's unable to raise himself. His sense of self-sufficiency, superiority, his angry self-righteousness, it, they cannot lift him. He says, I've sunk to the land where the bars close forever, to the roots of the mountain, to the pit. I am engulfed, surrounded, entangled, and trapped. I want us to see that the gospel pattern of this prayer invites us with Jonah into the awareness of our need, with the image of him sinking down to the root of the mountain. 
but that's not all that the prayer contains. There is a second part, a turning that happens that not only speaks of Jonah's condition, but casts hope in the one who lifts up. The second part is not Jonah sinking, but Jonah being raised by the God who helps the helpless. You see how Jonah turns in our passage, yet you, Lord, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. We can't miss this. Jonah, the one who has been running, the one who refuses to pray, the one who is not interested in mercy at all, now speaks of my God. My God. And we can ask, who is this my God for Jonah in this place? It is the one who lifts up the fallen, the one who takes people out of the pit. The one, as Psalm 40 says, draws us up from the pit of destruction, the miry bog, and sets our feet upon a rock, makes our steps secure. Ever since the enslaved Israelites were taken out of Egypt, the Lord is known as the one who leads out the helpless. In the story of Scripture, this is the Lord's most characteristic way of being, the one who leads out the helpless. And it's revealed most clearly in the person of Jesus. Remember, Jesus told us that the only sign that would be given to the religious leaders was the sign of Jonah. Inviting us to think about Jesus' life, that Jesus was humbled, that he went down, he sunk he took on flesh, became a servant, suffered, died, even death on the cross. One who was rejected for bearing our sins, cast aside, crushed, and laid in a tomb. But it's from that place where the bars close forever that Jesus was raised to new life. He ascends, God giving him the victory over sin and death, seating at the right hand of God, and given the name above all names to judge the living and the dead. See, the gospel pattern of this prayer that we're invited to think about in our own life is that question of who is God? Who is the one that we would pray to? Who could be my God? Is the God who enters our suffering, enters into the deep, who goes to the very bottom? to lift us up. As I was thinking about this prayer, I was thinking in our congregation, in our community, there's some of us who have recently lost loved ones, lost those who were dear to us. And how this prayer is such an important part of the gospel of Christ. When Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life, that all who believe in me, though they die, shall live. He is speaking specifically that he is the one who's gone down to the place that the bars close forever to come forth with new life for hope in the midst of grief and loss. And if this is who our God is, then it makes sense that all who would identify with Jesus are not those who know how to swim, <laughs> know how to handle the waves that come upon you. But those who bear the name of Christ are those who have been raised up in him, who know his mercy. But Jonah prays, you, Lord, brought me up from the pit. And we see at the end of our passage that God appoints the fish, God speaks to the fish and tells him to spit Jonah out now, obviously, this is a unique moment far in the past. But as I mentioned in the beginning, that Jonah is inviting you and me to join him in this prayer, to make these words our own, and to join him to, to come and know our condition and turn to the Lord who lifts up the fallen. It's described in the prayer as remembering the Lord. Remembering the Lord. When my life was fainting away, the Lord I remembered. Memories are important to us. 
We do all sorts of things to remember. We have celebrations on special dates. We tell stories to each other. We take lots of pictures and videos. I came across the, an article that said back in the, the, the highlight of using film in your cameras, if you're old enough to remember that, that on average the Amer American would take around 50 pictures a year when there was uh, film in their cameras. Maybe you can ima imagine today how many photos are taken today. Collectively, they say in America it's over one trillion photos, which equals out to about 3,300 photos a year each person, which I calculated is like nine a day. <laughs> we take lots of photos. And I was thinking about that collection of videos and images on our phones or on our computers or wherever. And thinking about these collection of memories and some of them are more powerful than others in our life, right? Speaking about who we are or what we want or what we say matters. And I was thinking for Jonah and his experience that that collection of memories, the collection of photos, if such a thing existed for him, that when we first meet him, the, the memories that are the strongest for him, the ones that kind of dominate the story of who he is, is that he is from Israel. He keeps the law. He doesn't need mercy. And in fact, he is different from those other people over there who seem to be doing everything wrong. He tells us that in doing that, he realizes in the deep that he was holding on to a vain idol. Things that were empty shells, a breath that would pass away. And he says rather what we should do is remember God in his steadfast love. And it's a chance for you and I to think about whether we remember God or what memories or what images are the dominant parts of our story. See, to remember God with Jonah doesn't mean that our circumstances are radically different or, or that pain is no longer pain or loss is no longer loss. But it's rather putting the reality of God and his steadfast love into the midst of our worries, into the midst of our losses, into the midst of our concerns. It's remembering turning our hearts with a good, dis a good disruption that adds God and God's presence into our circumstances, into our future, into our shame and into our anger, into the pit at the very bottom when we're alone. And it speaks to the questions, who am I? And is there any hope for me? Jonah reminds us by the grace of God, yes, by pointing to Christ, the one who went to the bottom to lift us up, to make us his own. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are and your grace to us. I pray that you would encourage us by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you stand with us and we'll sing together?
give you thanks, O God, who abundantly pours out your grace toward us. You heal the sick, mend the broken, give sight to the blind, comfort the hurting, and promise to raise the dead to life. Give us faith to trust that your will shall be done as we join with your people on earth and all the company of heaven in the unending hymn. seated. Well, having heard God's word, we're now invited to the table that God sets for his people. At this time, we're going to celebrate communion through these prepackaged elements. If, if you're a follower of Christ and plan on participating in communion, and if you need one, just raise your hand, and Pastor Brian can bring one. Does anybody need one? Okay. Well, I invite you, if you plan to participate in communion, to go ahead and prepare those Jesus says at this table to do this in remembrance of me. And we heard in the prayer that Jonah makes from the belly of the fish, you, Lord, I remembered. And this is an opportunity for us to remember the Lord. To come forth in honesty with our sin. To come forth and acknowledge our anger, our weariness, our struggles, our uncertainties. And to remember the Lord in the midst of those things. That by his blood and by his body, we are not on our own, but that we are children of God. And God has made a promise in his steadfast love that nothing can separate us from him. Nothing in life, nor even death. So let us remember as we gather at Christ's table this good news. Let it disrupt both our present, but even as we look to the past or our future. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are, that you are a good God, who although you are high and mighty, you lift up the lowly. Thank you that you did not forget us or leave us in our disobedience and our chasing after false hopes. You did not leave us in our sin or at the bottom, but have gone to lift us up in Christ. 
Let us remember by your spirit and, and let that be a new way of being that we may go forth as your people, loving one another and loving our neighbors. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on the night that he was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ's body was broken to make us whole. Let us eat in faith. Christ's blood was shed to call over all of our sins. Let us drink in faith. Well, I invite you to stand with me that we can pray and sing in response to this table of grace as God's people. Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised to make all things new. By your spirit, remind us that you have already paid our debt before God and help us to look forward to the future with hope as we proclaim the mystery of faith. you to join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, God is the giver of all good gifts. And so in response to his generosity, I invite you to give to the work of the church. You can do so through the church's website or through the silver offering plates in the back. But in response to God's generosity, let's sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Just a reminder before I offer the blessing, and please take your communion supplies with you and throw them out at the trash by the door on the way out. It would be great help. Receive now God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forever. Amen. We go in peace.